start with the uh, BGP scaling presentation. I'll also go through the 4x AS numbers as well. We didn't really talk about those very much apart from the mention that they existed. So I'll go through that in a bit of detail. So we'll do these two presentations. Once we do the BGP scaling presentation, it will, it will let us do the um, let us do the lab. I want to do the BGP route reflector lab. Um, that's very important. I mean, some of you have got quite small networks, but as all your networks grow, you need to find ways of scaling the BGP. So, um, I really want to do the route reflector lab so that you can see how you might scale your BGP uh, as we go forward. So, if you look in the BGP presentations folder, um, you'll see this uh, presentation one. It's the BGP scaling techniques presentation. So, just going going through it. Um, so the original BGP specification was, I suppose, was put together really for networks from the early 90s. Right? That's what really when this all started. So in those days. The routers were very simple. They only had maybe one megabyte of memory. The processors, as I was saying yesterday, was a slower than what's in your mobile phone today. So they're very, very weak uh, processors. Getting even one megabyte of memory was very, very expensive, so it was difficult to do. So the BGP implementation was done very, very carefully to ensure that it was I suppose as efficient as possible for the internet of those days. This is why you have IBGP only passing on external prefixes. It doesn't pass on prefixes learned from other IBGP speakers because routers might end up with duplicate updates. So there are all those, those issues. So the developers were very careful to make sure that BGP was lightweight. And of course, the networks in those days were only what? Five, ten routers maximum. So doing a full mesh BGP was no real issue. But nowadays, we're looking at the major ISPs with 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 routers. Very, very big networks. Um, so a full mesh BGP really doesn't make much sense. So the issues as the internet grew included scaling the BGP mesh beyond a few peers, implementing new policy without causing flaps and route churns. Remember I said yesterday, when we implement policy in BGP, we have to do something called a route refresh. Well, that's relatively recent. That only appeared about 15 years ago. Before then, the ISPs had to shut down BGP and then start it again. And if you shut down BGP, you disappear from the internet. If you restart BGP, then you take some time to reappear. So it's not really, um, you know, it wasn't really an instant update of, of policies. So implementing new policy, that was an issue as well. And of course, just tr trying to keep things as stable, scalable, and as simple as possible. So the Current scaling techniques would be these ones. These are what folks are using quite a bit. There's the route refresh function that we talked a little bit about yesterday. Peer groups is all about Cisco iOS configuration, making the configuration simple. Uh, other vendors have similar concepts. And there's the BGP route reflector as well, which lets us scale the BGP mesh beyond 30 or 40 routers. There's also soft reconfiguration, which, well, one of you put on the lab on Monday and I said not to do it. Soft reconfiguration we don't need anymore because we have right refresh. And right flat damping was introduced in the mid 90s and was people stopped using it by the early 2000s um, because right flat damping was actually causing a lot of problems on the network. So we're going to look at all of these. So the first one is the route refresh. Um, so again, if you do a hard BGP reset, 
when you change policy? Well, this is probably a bit of an issue because it shuts down BGP session, you disappear from the internet, and then when you restart BGP again, you reappear. So doing a hard reset of BGP is really not a good idea. It, it disconnects you from the internet. So certainly on Cisco iOS, you want to be very careful. When you shut down BGP, or when you refresh BGP, you must make sure that it's not a hard reset, because that's the same as rebooting the router. So the solution for this is something called RAD Refresh. And it's a BGP feature. It's a BGP feature such that when you need to make a policy change, you send a message to the neighboring router saying, um, my policy has changed, please update your announcements to me. And so if you want to refresh your inbound policy, you send a message to the neighboring router and it will resend its BGP feed to you. Same thing, route refresh can work outbound as well. You can resend your full BGP announcement through your new filters to the neighboring router. So you don't need to configure anything. The routers negotiate automatically. And so when you start up a BGP session with the neighbor, you see that route refresh is negotiated automatically between the two routers. Doesn't need any extra memory. Um, this is the thing with soft reconfiguration. It uses a lot of extra memory to, to run it. Route refresh doesn't because it, it's not storing anything extra. Right, so the route refresh capability, RFC 2918, and you implemented clear IP BGP in or out. Right, those are the commands to do it. So clear IP BGP in means that you, your router sends a message to the neighboring router telling the neighboring router to resend its entire BGP feed to you. Clear IP BGP out tells your router to send its entire BGP feed out to the neighbor. Right, so that's the route refresh. You can use the soft command if you want, and I think the way it's going in future is that soft is going to be the regular command. So that's route refresh. Um, it's supported on all the routers I'm aware of today. Right. So what I'm really saying is, please remember, don't do a hard reset of BGP. I mean, a hard reset is the same as rebooting the router. It takes almost as long. If you're carrying a full BGP feed, it takes almost as long to do this. Cisco has soft reconfiguration. Um, some of you um, were using that, but please don't. Soft reconfiguration takes extra memory. It's only useful when you need to do troubleshooting of your BGP policy. If you're arguing with your peer about prefixes that haven't arrived or whatever, um, soft reconfiguration <coughs> lets you see what prefixes have arrived on your router before you apply your policy. That's the only advantage it does, because what it does it stores the BGP feed before you apply your policy. And so it takes extra memory. If you have a full BGP feed and you're applying policy to it, it could take up twice the amount of memory on the router. So ISPs only use it if they need to do troubleshooting. They only need to use it if they do troubleshooting. They don't use it otherwise. Because it works like this. You know, the, Normal BGP session announcements come into the BGP in process, but with soft reconfiguration running, the prefixes come in, they're stored in this BGP table here, and then they're applied to the in process. So you can see prefixes that are changed by the policy need extra memory because they're stored on the router. So if you're using soft reconfiguration, if you do show IP BGP, you see lots of prefixes that are marked as received only. That means they're taking up extra memory. It means that the policies that you have applied have changed and um, attributes on those prefixes. <laughs> so the way we configure soft reconfiguration is like this, neighbor, soft reconfiguration, like that. But you only use it on eBGP sessions 
if you need to troubleshoot policy. Otherwise, don't. If you use it, it actually disables write refresh. So that's not a good idea. Right, so it disables write refresh. So you want to avoid soft reconfiguration. Um, next thing, peer groups. Now, peer groups, this is, this is just for Cisco. So Cisco iOS has peer groups. Um, and what peer groups do, it's really a configuration, well, it's a way of making the configuration on the router simpler. That's what a peer group is for, making the configuration simpler. So as you saw, when you're setting up all the IBGP neighbors, um, all the configuration for each neighbor was the same. And that was a lot of typing for you to do. You had to type in the same thing, same thing, same thing. But the thing is, on the router, when it works out what it's got to send to a neighbor, it's sending the same updates to every single neighbor. That's wasteful. And what a peer group does is it groups all the same peers who have the same updates together into a group. It works out what the update is and then sends it to each neighbor. So rather than say if you've got 50 neighbors working out the update 50 times, it works out the update once and then sends it to the 50 neighbors. So it's actually much more efficient. Right to CPU wasted on repeat repeated calculations, and it meant that a large IBGP mesh was very slow to build. So this was the original design for a peer group to speed up IBGP um, convergence, to speed up IBGP deployment, make configuration much easier to read. And so there are lots of advantages. Easier configuration, less chance of a mistake, makes it more readable, lowers the router CPU load. I mean, we implemented peer groups for the first time, well, probably back in about 1995. We saw the router CPU go down 20%. If we added a router to the IBGP, it would take a minute or so to be fully converged, compared with 10 or even 15 minutes before, because we carried a full BGP feed and this just made everything really slow to converge on the network. I mean, interestingly enough, nowadays, um, iOS has got something called an update group internally. So the router works out itself all the neighbors that have the same policy. So peer groups in theory aren't used anymore. But in practice, it's still, these are still the advantages, these three here. It still makes the configuration easier to read less chance of you making a mistake. If you need to change your IBGP configuration, you change it in the peer group. Much easier doing it on one peer group on 50 routers, means you only have to log in 50 times, than changing it on 50 neighbors on 50 routers. Means you have two and a half thousand changes to make. So, this is still a very good advantage for peer groups. So when we get to the end of module seven, which I think we'll be doing tomorrow, um, module seven, we convert the IBGP to using a peer group. And you'll see how it makes the configuration easier. So this is what it looks like. So here's the IBGP session. Neighbor, IBGP peer group. We we give it a nice name, so give it a descriptive name. So this is the IBGP peer, peer group. The remote AS is the same because it's IBGP, so the remote autonomous system is the same. We have update source loopback zero. We already had that in the lab. Send community, we need route map out filter. We've got some outbound policy for our IBGP session. And then we apply it to each neighbor, right? So neighbor one, neighbor two, neighbor three, and so forth. So that's typically how we set up a peer group. See how it's easier than what we did in module one, or lab one. Lab one, we had neighbor, and then we had all these configuration lines. Neighbor two, all these lines. Neighbor three, all these lines. Whereas with a peer group, we put it all at the front, 
and then each neighbor just uses the peer group. If you've done computer programming, it's the same idea as a subroutine. You put everything that's commonly used in a subroutine and then call the subroutine rather than um, just writing it out in code each time. You can use the peer group for eBGP as well. Obviously the AS number is different. So we don't put the AS number in the peer group, but we can still put community and policy um, actions in the peer group as well. Again, generally, I find that you know, working with ISPs, I tend to use peer groups for everything. It just keeps the configuration easier. I use a peer group for IBGP. I use a peer group for an exchange point. I use a peer group for IPv6, IBGP. I use a peer group for the IPv6 exchange point. And I can show you some real live examples if you want, just to see the typical thing that people do. ISPs tend not to have custom configuration per neighbor. You use a peer group, and then you apply the peer group to each neighbor. So my advice, always configure peer groups for IBGP, even if they're only a few peers, because it makes it easier to scale things in the future. I would even say consider using peer groups for external BGP, especially if you've got multiple customers using the same AS. So that's RFC 2270, which we'll talk about tomorrow. And of course, it's useful at exchange points where the ISP policy is generally the same for each peer. So peer groups, as I said, they're basically obsolete, but I still find them very useful for documentation. Cisco wants you to use peer templates, but peer templates are very, very confusing, I find. Like update groups, it's internal, so the router can now work out all the peers with the same policy. But I still like peer groups because it makes the configuration easier to read. So when we get to the end of module seven, we'll, we'll set everything up using peer groups, and you can see how it works. Okay, the next one, route reflectors. This is how to scale IBGP. So here's our lab. We've got 14 routers, and it means we have 91 IBGP sessions running in the network. That's what we have at the moment, 91 IBGP sessions. Each router we add, the number of sessions goes up more or less by n squared. Right? It's actually this. That's how the, the mesh goes up. It's basically n squared. So each session we add, it goes up um, by the square of the number of sessions, or number of routers we have. So 15 routers would end up being what? About 100 and 110. Um, by the time you get to, well, 1,000 routers, you're looking at nearly half a million IBGP sessions. So this obviously does not scale. And n squared growth isn't scalable. If it goes up by n, then it does scale. But n squared does not. It goes up like that. So we need to find something else. Um, we can't run a full mesh BGP for a large network. And there are two solutions. Um, two solutions here. One solution is the right reflector. And actually, the right reflector came, came second. And the right reflector came second. The first solution that came around was Confederation. Confederation was coded up by Cisco engineers over a weekend, more or less, when one big US ISP um, had a big problem with the network. They got to about 65 routers. They added one more, and the whole BGP mesh fell over. Everything broke. And they had to switch off several routers before they could get the BGP mesh back again. And the reason was the CPUs were not strong enough to maintain that number of BGP sessions. That was the issue. And so the Cisco engineers had to work, and they worked over a weekend, to find an alternative solution. And the alternative solution was the confederation and what that did 
was divide the network up into pieces. And I'll show you the confederation next. Divided the network up into pieces, lots of sub-autonomous systems that then paired with each other, but at the edge of the network, when they talked to other ISPs, they pretended that there was still one AS. So it was a bit of an ugly hack, but it actually worked. The second solution that came along about six months later was the route reflector. Route reflector was much simpler. And people just said, well, okay, normal IBGP does this. An external prefix comes in to route to B, B sends it on to A, and sends it on to C. That's the normal IBGP session. So B you send it to A, B sends it to C. That's a normal IBGP. So people then said, well, why can't router A, given that B sending C, why can't, well, B sending to A, why can't A just send the prefix on to C? You know, why can't we just do that? And the answer is, well, good question. No real reason. The thing is, you know, if B sent to A and A sends to C, but B sends it to C as well, we get two updates landing on router C. And so people were worried that the router CPU would be overloaded because it would get a duplicate update. Two updates for the same information. So this is where the route reflector came in. We can define a route reflector to take IBGP prefixes and pass them on under certain rules. Right? There's some very simple rules, and these are here. Right? So a route reflector um, well, let's see, a right reflector sitting there, A is a right reflector, it's got some clients, prefixes start off at the client, goes to router A. Router A, if it's a reflector, can send the prefixes back to clients, and it can send them to normal BGP speakers as well. So the red lines here are IBGP sessions. So as long as there's some rules, then this all works. If router B sends a prefix on to router A, A will send it on to clients only. A will not send it on to C, which is a normal BGP speaker. So those, those are the, the simple rules. So looking back here, best path from a client reflect to other clients and non-clients. Right, so the best path is from a client, so the prefix comes from the client, gets sent to A, A will send it back to the clients and to the other reflectors. If the prefix comes from a non-client, so a normal BGP speaker, ends up in A, we then send it to our clients only. We don't send it to other normal BGP speakers. So what we have to do when we set up IBGP is define which of our neighbors are clients? The neighbors of ours which are clients, we apply these special rules to. So we've got normal BGP speakers in the network, and then we've got special neighbors which are clients. So how do we set up the backbone? Well, we divide it up into multiple clusters. We have at least one route reflector and a few clients per cluster. So like I did here, something like this. Here are my core routers. Here are the routers in each pop. So that's, that's a very typical design where the core routers are the route reflectors and the other routers in the pop are the clients. Route reflectors, normal BGP mesh, but the, cluster, the clients in the cluster, generally they can be fully meshed if you want to do it, but most people just have them talking to the route reflectors. This is just a BGP thing. We don't touch ISIs or OSPN. So it's just a BGP design. I mentioned new attributes yesterday when I was looking at the path selection. You've got the originator ID attribute, which carries the router ID of the originator. You've got the cluster list attribute, which is the cluster ID. Uh, in other words, the identifier of the route reflector. So it's the router ID of the route reflector. And that's used just to identify where the prefix has gone through the network. So that's 
that's really all the right reflector, uh, the two new attributes are for. So we use cluster list as part of the path selection process. And we'll see the cluster list when we do the lab uh, later on. Um, you can, can configure multiple route reflectors in the same cluster. I tend not to do that because a lot of things can go wrong. People have had a lot of issues with that. A router can be a client of route reflectors in different clusters, and that's more the way we try and uh, achieve redundancy. So the picture would look like this. Right, you've got the pop here, you've got your two core routers, you've got the other three routers in the point of presence. So the red lines show the first cluster. There should be blue lines, but anyway, these lines are the um, second cluster. Okay. So you can overlay the right reflectors like this. And so the clients can speak to right reflect two different right reflectors. This is the typical design that people use. So if this router breaks, then this router is the right reflector for the three clients here. And we don't end up any problems with um, clashing router IDs and so forth. The problem is, if you have two route reflectors with the same identifier, and you don't have a physical connection between the two of them, then you can end up with routing loops and black holes in the network, so disconnections in the network. It's a common mistake that some people make. They have route reflectors with the same identifier in different parts of the network. And when something in the network breaks, usually in the backbone, you end up with disconnectivity, like split horizon type disconnectivity, between the two right reflectors. We have seen enough of this happening to say don't have the same identifier on different routers. Make the identifiers different and we do it like this. Have two clusters overlaid and that works much better. So that's a right reflector. It solves the IBGP mesh problem. Doesn't affect packet forwarding. Normal BGP speakers coexist. We use multiple reflectors for redundancy, so we have two reflectors in the cluster. Or two reflectors in the pop, I mean. Two clusters. Very easy to migrate to. I mean, we're going to take this lab and migrate it to using route reflectors without breaking anything. Usually when I do this workshop, um, we manage to convert to route reflectors without breaking um, any of the sessions. It is possible to do it. Where do we put the right reflectors? Follow the physical topology. That's very important as well. And that will guarantee that packet forwarding is not affected. We configure one right reflector at a time, eliminate the redundant BGP sessions, and put one right reflector per cluster. So we'll, we'll do this in the lab, and you'll see how it will, will work. So something like this, right, we decide that router D is going to be a right reflector. So we declare on router D that E, F, and G are clients. Once we've declared that these are clients, we then remove the redundant BGP sessions from A, B, and C to E, F, and G. So it's a very, very simple thing. As long as you have a strategy, it's a very simple migration to do. We went right reflectors first appeared in Cisco IOS. We had a colleague and me at UUNet. We migrated our network, 60 routers or so, in a two hour maintenance slot. So we got up very early one morning and spent two hours migrating them all to using right reflectors. It was very, very simple to do. Whereas UUNet in the US, um, six months earlier, when they had to go to confederations, it was a lot of work. It took them many days to migrate the network to using confederations. It caused a lot of problems. Whereas for us, right reflectors, very, very simple. And what was funny at the time is the Americans said, oh, you're silly, you shouldn't be using right reflectors, confederations are much better, and so forth. But they had all the problems, and for us, it was a simple two-hour job. ISPs I visited, 
I've converted to route reflectors. We've done it during the day on a live network, and nobody's noticed anything. Right? If you do it properly, there is no break in packet forwarding or routing. This is how we configure it. So this is on router D. We're declaring that these neighbors, E, F, and G, route reflector client. That's the special keyword that you need. We declare that this neighbor is a client. That means we have the special IBGP rules. Remember the rules. If the prefix comes from the client, we distribute it to other clients and to normal BGP speakers. If the prefix comes from normal BGP speakers, we pass it on to our clients. So those are the right reflector rules. And that's what this configuration does. Right, so those are the three scaling techniques that we should be using. Route refresh, as we'll do in module 7. Peer groups, we'll do in module 7. Route reflectors, we'll do next. So we'll do route reflectors next. I'll show you the slides um, for BGP confederations here. I've included them. It's not that you'll use confederations now, but just so you are aware. But the confederation looks something like this. Right? So you've got your autonomous system here, but you divide your network up into sub-ASs internally. We divide them into sub-ASs internally. So what we have is, say, router A and router C talk eBGP to each other. But it's not the same eBGP as you use for talking to the outside world. So some people call it eIBGP. Right? So E for external, I for internal, eIBGP. Right? It's an external BGP but with different rules. Right? The next hop is maintained and all this sort of thing. Um, so the way we configure it, this is on router C, router BGP 64532 on here. Confederation identified, this is the AS number we really are in. And then the confederation peers, this tells us which other autonomous systems are in the confederation. And then we have EB, EIBGP sessions with the other members. So that's the sort of thing that we had. So you can see why going to confederation is quite challenging. Because if you're all routed BGP 200, you've got to redo your BGP to say routed BGP private AS and put in all this confederation stuff. So it gets quite tricky to migrate. It does mean downtime on the network. And that's not good. So the various rules, I won't go through them. Um, I'll just point out, yes, the AS path, so you're inside the confederation, the AS path looks like this. So we've got the uh, this destination. The confederation ASs are in brackets. And then the public and ASs are not. So that's just the thing to be aware of. Uh, what else? So a show IPBGP would look something like this. So you see the confederation ASs sitting in brackets like that. What else about confederations? Well, if you're buying up other ISPs, confederations might be useful. Because it means that if you want to absorb their network into your network, you just make their network part of your confederation. So that actually makes it quite simple. You don't have to go and renumber all the BGP sessions. So sadly, when Vario was built as an ISP, this is what they did. Various started off as a very, very small ISP in North America, and they went buying other ISPs. They bought, 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 bought. Kept adding ISPs until the network was one of the biggest. Okay, so the confederation is a very useful way of doing that sort of merging of networks. Um, you can use confederations with right reflectors. So inside the confederation AS, you can still use the route reflector setup. Some of the issues, there's only a limited number of sub-ASs. There are only 1,023 of them. So okay, that should really be a scaling problem, but it's still a limit. 
Um, there's a hierarchy of some ESs. You've got to do your network design so it, it, all the different parts of the network can peer together with each other. Can get complicated. Path diversity, very difficult to migrate to. So we compare the two of them, something like this. You know, we've got confederations, you can use anywhere. Scalability, medium, complexity, quite difficult to migrate to. Whereas right reflectors, very highly scalable, very low migration complexity. Very, very simple to do. So I generally recommend, if you want to scale your IBGP, use a right reflector. Indeed, ISPs have just started, maybe even two or three routers. Start with route reflector because it becomes very easy to add more routers to your network. Okay. So, I mean, again, I know you've all got different sizes of networks here. Um, but for those of you running smaller networks, take a look at the route reflector because it means it will let you scale your BGP sessions better than trying to do full mesh. The other thing that's bad, um, well, the th one of the things that's bad, I should say, route flat damping. Now, this was introduced in the mid 90s to deal with instability on in the internet. What was happening in the mid 90s? A lot of people were still connecting by dial up. Right? So, it was a lot of dial up connections. And people would make the connection, they would dial in, announce the address space on the internet. Get their email, then hang up. <coughs> Two minutes later, dial in, announce the address, get the email, hang up. There was a lot of dial on demand connections to the internet. And the problem was that the ISPs hosting these customers would only announce the address space when they dialed in. And when they did dial in, they would withdraw it. So the problem we were seeing was a lot of announcement withdrawal, announce withdrawal happening on the network. So flat damping was introduced. Now back in the mid-90s, the internet was very small. There weren't many ISPs. The connectivity of the internet was such that there were a few ISPs in the core and many around the edge. But nowadays, the internet is much more richly connected. There are many, many more interconnections. So prefixes that are flapping um, have a different impact from what they had 15 years ago. And so it's actually trying to do something about these flaps causes problems. So for many years, flap damping was strongly recommended. Now it's actually strongly discouraged. So the way the flap damping works is, well, the right flap is a BGP withdrawal followed by a BGP update. Okay, that's, a, that's a definition of a flap. So the prefix disappears, and then it comes back again. That's a flap. And these ripple through the whole internet, they waste CPU, and flat damping aims to reduce the scope of the flat propagation. That's what it is designed to do. If somebody bounces a prefix, the whole internet sees it. So flat damping is trying to stop the whole internet from seeing this change. So the requirements are fast convergence for normal rack changes, Use history to predict the future. Suppress routes that are bouncing up and down. But advertise routes which are stable. That's what we're going to try and do. So the way it works, every time a prefix flaps, we add a penalty of 1,000. Any time a BGP attribute changes, we add a penalty of 500. We exponentially decay this penalty. So every minute that passes, we exponentially decay the penalty value. Once the penalty goes above a predefined limit, we stop announcing the prefix. In other words, once the prefix is flapped too much, we stop advertising the prefix to our neighbors. Once the penalty has decayed below a reuse limit, then we re-advertise the prefix again. So the picture looks like this. Right? So this is the time axis. This is the penalty. So as time goes along, prefix flaps, exponential decay, flaps again, exponential decay, flaps again. Penalty is now above a suppressed limit. 
So this means the prefix is no longer a noun. It carries on flapping until it's fixed. Then we have exponential decay all the way down to a reuse limit here. And that's when the network is now re-announced. So as you can see in the picture, we flap three times, we disappear for a very long time. But we disappear until the prefix stops flapping and the penalty has decayed back to a reuse limit. So flap damping only used for external BGP. Alternative path is still usable and the various things that you can chew. So we'll jump over all of this. Now, first implementations appeared in about 95. The vendor defaults were too severe. I mean, it was, Cisco was really the first vendor that introduced flat damping. Well, the issue is that, well, nobody had any experience of BGP flaps. So Cisco had to pick some numbers that seemed reasonable. So Cisco thought, well, if the prefix flaps three times, then we knock it out for um, 60 minutes. That was the Cisco default. So flap three times, gone for 60 minutes. Um, well, that's okay, but that's hard to explain to people. If, you, if your prefix has flapped three times and you're gone for an hour, and your customer's trying to get to the site, what do you tell them? You say, well, you know, sorry, you know, it's just, it's flat damping, we have to do it. And the customer doesn't know what this is, they just see it as connection to the internet. So, it's just meaning to the ISP that, well, you disconnected me for an hour. The defender defaults were too severe. And so the RIPE Writing Working Group, this is the European um, Internet Organization, RIPE, the working group there on writing. Um, in various documents, made recommendations about what flat damping values should be used to try and lessen the impact on, say, critical infrastructure like the root name servers. So that was, so that's what really what all the efforts were. But the problem is many ISPs switched on the vendor default. They looked at the vendor manual and said, oh, got to do flat damping, so they switched it on. So Cisco, three times gone for an hour. Juniper, twice gone for half an hour. So that wasn't any better. Right. So the vendor defaults were too tough. And many people were just switching it on. The whoops. Oh, that's impressive. The button got stuck in my remote control. Right, so the, the researchers started looking at flat damping. And what they found was that ISPs who switch on flat damping actually make stability of the writing system worse. So this was 2002, so this was after about two years of research, started by Craig Lamovitz and Abba Hucha. This started in about 99, 2000, looking at writing convergence. And they discovered that ISPs who were using flat damping, the networks actually took longer to converge than ISPs who were not using flat damping. And the work was continued by Marley Mao and her team and they published this paper which said flat damping is bad. That's basically what it says. It's bad. It actually makes matters worse. More research, well, Tim Griffin, AT&T, Labs, what's the sound of one route, what is the sound of one route flapping? So what that means is if you announce a prefix and then withdraw the prefix, and the re then re-announce it, what do you see? Well, you would think, if you go somewhere else on the internet, you would see the prefix disappear, and then reappear. But you don't. You see the prefix disappear, reappear, disappear, reappear, many, many, many times. So the sound of one ride flapping is actually very noisy. It's not just appear, disappear, appear. It actually comes and goes many, many, many times. 
So here's the first problem. If one path flaps, BGP speaker will pick the next best path and announce it to all peers. Flat path counts are incremented. These peers see a change in best path. So the flat count is incremented again, the attribute is changing. And after a few hops, peers are seeing multiple changes caused by single flat because ISPs are so richly connected now. The internet is not a long string. Every ISP is connected to every ISP, many, many peers. Remember I said on Monday, the internet is about peering. You use transit as a last resort. Internet is peering. So ISPs peer with each other as much as they can. And all these peers were telling each other, oh, this path has gone, the best path is now this way. So this information was being sent around many, many times, which meant the AS path attribute was changing, which means that flat counters were being incremented, which means that prefixes were being suppressed, which means that paths were changing, which means flat counters were incremented, and you see it's a vicious circle. So just one simple announcement could cause big problems. Okay? It's a bit like you know you go out of the hotel and blow into the sky, just go like that into the sky, and it causes a big thunderstorm over somewhere else in other part of the country. It's that kind of impact. One tiny little prefix flat causes a massive storm across the internet. Also, different BGP implementations have different transit times for prefixes. Some hold on to the prefix for some time before advertising. So if you send a BGP update to a Cisco router, a Cisco router will only send the update onwards at a predefined interval. Whereas if you send a BGP announcement to a Juniper router, it sends it on immediately. It doesn't wait for a predefined interval. So if you go through, if your prefix is announced through networks that are mostly Cisco, it takes a few minutes. If it goes through networks that are mostly Juniper, it goes instantly. So the problem is that ISPs along the path who interconnect see the best path changing all the time. When the best path changes, AS path attribute changes, it looks as though the prefix is flapping, it's not, it's simply the best path is changing because of the different transit times of BGP prefixes. Solution, don't use flat damping. So if you're using it already on your network, please switch it off. It causes serious damage to your network and to the internet. Right? So don't do it. So make sure when you go back, you do not have flat damping running. If you want to read more reasons why, they're all written up here, right 378. Researchers are trying to find ways of making write flat damping usable. In fact, there's another draft just published a few days ago, uh, which says, no, there is no way to make flat damping usable. The researchers spent quite a bit of time looking to see, and they've come to the conclusion there's absolutely no way with the internet we have today because of the rich peering connection that we have that we can make flat damping useful. So those are the BGP scaling techniques. So as I said in the lab, after the tea break, we're going to um, do the BGP right reflector.